former journalist. Uh, and uh, my background is in creating uh, a small welfare to work organisation in the uh, arts and creative industries. Uh, in order to get people back to work. We've got about 800 people back to work over the last couple of years. Uh, mainly using the Future Jobs Fund, but we've also worked uh, with the Work Programme and with uh, European Social Fund uh, schemes. Um, and so we've worked with government, we've worked with Labour government, we've worked with the Coalition government, we've worked with charities, we've worked with prime contractors. We haven't worked with Working Links, but we have worked with others. Um, we've worked with the Arts Council, we've worked with the Royal Opera House, we've worked with the Notting Hill Carnival. Um, we work with pretty much everyone, and we have not worked with one single housing association. Now that's perhaps our fault. Um, it's perhaps your fault. It's our joint responsibility. It shouldn't be this way. But I'll leave you with that thought uh, as we continue. Uh, I'll introduce the panel one by one. We have a very strict running order, uh, and they will each make their opening remarks, probably from the lectern, uh, and then we'll open the discussion to the floor. So, from the uh, far left is uh, Sinead Butters, who's the Chief Executive of Aspire Housing. My immediate left is Deem Zahawi, uh, MP, uh, also a member of the Biz Select Committee. Uh, to my immediate right uh, is Stephen Evans, uh, also, I hope, one of the good guys, Director for Skills and Employment at, at Working Links. And to his right is Stephanie Burroughs, uh, the founder and chief executive of the uh, head partnership. And again, I'll, I'll let her introduce herself and, and what she does when the time comes. And that is Sinead Butters. We are allowed to give you a welcoming round of applause. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm David Deal. You've been here all day. It's dead hot, and I've got seven minutes. So I'll try and stick to my seven minutes, and I'll try and keep it punchy for you. I'm Sinead, and I run this. And uh, this is a, a group of um, social enterprise and housing partners that deliver a range of housing, regeneration and training activity in the uh, North Staffordshire. 650 people, it's employees, and it, uh, its turnover is around about 45 million pounds. Um, what I want to say is that we have a triple whammy effect. And the triple whammy effect is about the group philosophy. We started as a stock transfer housing association in 2000. Then we had about 300 people in our business and we focused on uh, investing in our homes, in the physical infrastructure and nothing else. We work in a very deprived environment, we top 5%, 10% uh, high levels of people, not education in full training and basically we realised that if we were going to carry on tarting up the houses then actually we might as well go home because our customers needed a lot more than that. So what are we now? We see ourselves as a community resource and we turn our business inside out to help people have a chance at getting a job, getting employment, getting skills and training. We're not a housing business. We're no longer a housing business. We're a re regeneration agency that impacts positively in the local community that we operate. And I think that's important. Sometimes we end up only talking about housing and talking to each other. It's not about that anymore. We're a local business. We're a local business that works with other local businesses and we happen to have a, a strong passion for what we believe in, which is the impact we can have when we target our resources effectively. Okay, so what do we do? We deliver housing and training services, we deliver added value services, some of which aren't funded. I'm making a political comment here. Now the government's looking at rent restructuring has taken out a £2 convergence rate. Some of these will be challenging to do because our business, some of our rents don't hit target rent until 2035. So, you know, government ministers have asked us, what do you want us to do? How can we help you? I tell you what, put the £2 back in the convergence. Um, that's my view anyway, and I'm sure everyone has got different perspectives. It's not all about new build housing either. In our community, new build is one facet of a contribution to helping that community survive and flourish. For us, the big issue is employment, skills and health. Um, we can contribute to that, but we're not the panacea, we're not the full answer. What we can do is we can help people into work. And we bought a training company. And that, tra that training company is PM Training here. It started as a £2 million business, is now an £8 million social enterprise business. 
And that eight million pound business started off in front of 50 people, it's got 150 people. It gets 40, excluded 14 year olds through foundation learning tier, enter to employment, into apprentices, and it has a network of 800 businesses. So we see ourselves as a local business that champions businesses to take on apprentices and that helps businesses by providing the training services through our group. Okay, so the things we do, not just what we do, we do a lot of things, all these sort of things here, but actually it's the way we do it that stands us out, and this is why it's a triple whammy effect. What we do is socially value added. A former housing association focused on bricks and mortar that now is a social regeneration agency for, for the local community. But how we do it is important. Something like 12% of our own staff, those 650 people are young apprentices, 16 to 18 year olds. We've got them throughout the business, we've got them in every part of the business. We've got them in HR, in IT, in, 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 in finance. We've got them in, if you like, customer services at front of house, greeting our customers. It's such a passion that we give those young people a chance that actually we create more opportunities than we're able to give work to. However, there's some fantastic successes that we have in getting those people into work. In respect of our training company, 2,000 young people go through those doors every year. And some, in, in, in relation to numbers, we get a, a positive regression rate of around 60%. And from those 2,000 people, there's a 75% of them have a reading age of nine or below. And yet, around 60% get a job in one of our businesses that we connect with, one of our 800 businesses. What we tend to do is we like to work with our businesses to create opportunities with them. So we hold supply chain events with the councils, with the big employers, people like Seddon, Stoke City Council, Staffordshire County Council, um, with the police, with the health authority. And we hold supply chain events encouraging them to take on an apprentice and we can support them through our training company. In that way, we've created 500 apprentices in the local community that otherwise wouldn't have been there. Now, to me, that's about leadership. It's about having the passion and championing with the own, our own statement that we've got 12, 10, 12% 12 young people in our business. Where's your commitment? Where's your CSR? I don't care whether you do it because you want to win business with us. I don't care whether you do it and you don't believe in doing it. Just damn well do it. And so, you know, that, that's, that's where I am. And, we do all of these things, and the reason is, is because we want this business to, to stretch every sinew it possibly can, and other people's sinews that not, that's not their own, because we don't know it and we believe that, that our passion can be infectious. And I'll give you an example. We launched a volunteering strategy. We've got about a thousand hours wrapped up of volunteering in our, in our business. And now, we work with Keele University. I'm an ex-graduate from Keele, who is on our doorstep. And we were able to, to persuade, cajole, and encourage Keele to take up volunteering for their 10,000 students. And those students are now targeted at our needs in our communities. So we're stretching our reach and, and exploiting, if you like, the potential of the resource locally to be able to, to create opportunities for, for our people to live in, in a better environment. We deliver undergraduate traineeships, we deliver um, internships, we do loads and loads of things and I won't bore you with it but you can see it's all about making a statement about what the business is about and the way we did it we found the money by making sure every one of our senior management team took on at least one apprentice and we said to them basically if you can't find five or six grand for a year's worth of giving someone a chance then you shouldn't be a senior management manager in our business because actually it's a basic a basic ability to be able to find that from a 45 million pound business so the triple whammy effect. So what I'm trying to say is what we do is socially value added. But more importantly, it's how you do it. Because how you do it can create an environment that makes the business feel like that it, the conjoined efforts of all part of the business, whether you're um, a maintenance manager or whether you're working as an MVQ assessor in the training company, that you take a neighbourhood and you can see the impact that we've had in that neighbourhood because that's what we believe in, that everyone's got the potential to be fantastic. And so for us... That's uh, you know what, what what's my lesson? Believe in something, and when you find what you believe in, you make sure you absolutely go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Um, if every small and medium-sized business employed one person, then we'd solve the unemployment challenge in our country. In fact. We wouldn't just solve it. Uh, 
we then have significantly more vacancies than those looking for work. Now, that is stating the bleeding obvious, uh, but it really does make a difference if we can focus our energies, our efforts on SMEs in our country. There are estimated to be about 4.8 million SMEs in the UK. They already employ 14.1 million people. And of course, in case anyone didn't know this, there are about two and a half million people who are currently out of work. So even if only half those SMEs took on an extra person, we'd nearly clear the unemployment register. Collectively, SMEs are a powerhouse for growth, responsible for nearly 60% of all private sector employment and an annual turnover of 1.5 billion pounds. When we talk about the need to support growth in the economy, to create jobs, to get people back into work, it's all too easy to look to the big companies, the large caps, but SMEs offer real growth potential. It's also where innovation is at. I passionately believe that SMEs often have the flexibility and the nimbleness that large corporations lack. This means they can adapt to today's rapidly changing marketplace in ways that larger companies are simply unable to. That isn't to say that there aren't challenges. There's a good reason why government tends to reach for the low hanging fruit of large corporations to grow jobs and opportunity. Your average SME doesn't have an HR department to run a detailed recruitment exercise. They don't have a corporate induction program to mould young school leavers into employees. And they don't have the resources to engage with schools and other organisations to discuss skills gaps in the local economy. In fact, your average SME is purely focused on running the business. I've been there. When you start a business, you're the accountant, the salesman, the receptionist answering the phone, oh, and you're actually doing the work itself when you win your first contract. But it's SMEs and entrepreneurs that have the most potential to create jobs. And that's why we have to do all we can to make the act of taking someone on as easy as possible. In fact, we have to do all we can to create a supportive environment for SMEs and entrepreneurship. That means removing barriers to growing a business, removing barriers for SMEs to sell to the public bodies and semi-public bodies like housing associations, and supporting people to take that first step and start a business. Now, 62%, almost two thirds of SMEs are sole traders, with a big chunk of those being in the construction industry. If only half of them took on a young person, as an apprentice or a trainee, then we'd solve youth unemployment tomorrow and have jobs left over. Of course, if you're a sole trader, or in fact an SME of any size, then taking on a member of staff is a big step. There's costs involved and worries that the employee might not work out. But most of all, it's a leap of faith in your business and its ability to grow. And that's why we have to make it as easy as possible. Because if the, if the barriers look too high, then the majority will carry on trading alone. That means doing two things. One, making sure that we have a workplace with the skills people want, not the skills we think they need. Two, ensuring that those barriers to both employment and growth are as low as possible, if not removed altogether. Now in government, I think we're working hard on both those areas, a workforce with the skills that people want and removing the barriers. Perhaps one of the biggest barriers we've brought down is that of cost. From April of next year, 
a business will be able to hire one person on £22,000 a year or four people on the minimum wage and pay no employer's national insurance whatsoever. That's a saving of £2,000 a year. And we're also working hard on skills. There has been significant investment in apprenticeships which provide a useful route for SMEs to bring on younger staff and have them trained at no cost to themselves. We're also tackling basic skills, numeracy and literacy. Michael Gove's reforms are transforming education, ensuring that every child, regardless of where they go to school, has a grounding in the basics, regardless of what some on the, light, on the left might claim, this basic grounding is vital and incredibly important for business. For those out of work, there are also opportunities to upskill with the enterprise allowance for those wanting to start their own business. And of course, the work programme, providing training for the long-term unemployed. It is early days. I think there needs to be refinement, certainly around the work programme and uh, the third sector, and certainly the smaller uh, charities in the third sector. But on both of these programmes, um, the initial results are promising. It's in this area of skills that I think housing providers have a real opportunity to contribute. They are in a unique position to leverage both their position in the community and the knowledge they have at, of their tenants to help identify and bridge local skills gaps for SMEs. Bridging that gap may take many different forms. We've just heard from Sinead. It could come through skills training delivered by themselves or in partnership with other organisations, such as training providers, colleges and, of course, local schools. Doing this may mean stepping slightly outside the current remit of a housing provider, but today's event is about setting a new social bar. And what better bar could be set than supporting the growth and sustainability of your local economy? Thank you very much. So, given, given the time constraints, I wanted to make three points and then three um, recommendations about what we can do about them. Um, but first, I'd like to just quickly um, uh, mentioning who working links are in case there are people in the room who don't know. Um, so, we were set up in 2000 as a public private voluntary sector partnership um, to get people out of work, back to work. Um, so, we're a third owned by the government, a third owned by the voluntary sector, and a third owned by the private sector. So whichever one of those you don't like, we've got some of that. Uh, whichever one of those you do like, we've got some of that too. Um, we're a prime provider of the, of the work programme in Scotland, Wales and the South West, as well as delivering apprenticeships, skills training and a whole bunch of other stuff. So we've got our fingers in a lot of pies. Um, so so based, based on that experience, I just want to make three, three points. So the first is um, about long-term worklessness. So, there are around about a million people on the work programme across the UK as a whole, um, all of whom have been out of work for at least a year. And if you look at Job Seekers Allowance, 9 in 10 people leave Job Seekers Allowance within a year. So we're talking about the 10% that are left there, they've had a year with Job Centre Plus, they haven't found a job, they need extra help and support. But coupled with that, one of the good things about the work programme, I think, is that you're also getting support to people who were previously uh, written off, uh, people on uh, previous, uh, previous versions of incapacity benefits and, and what have you are getting um, or reporting to this system in the way they never were before. So if I look at the 100,000 people we've got on the work programme, a third of them have been out of work for five years or more. Um, five years or more. So, so these people that um, have become, you know, many have never worked before. We've got a labour market over the last 10 years, 10, 20 years or so, that's really polarised between um, what um, in terms of term lovely jobs and lousy jobs with nothing in the middle, this hourglass labour market. Because there's nowhere for people to go once they get into those entry level jobs. And that's why I think it's really critical that the full set of interventions, whether it's skills, whether it's employment, whether it's housing, are trained on helping us to create uh, um, progression routes and helping people to access them. So it's not just about a job, it's about a job and then a career. And then the third point I want to make is about assets. 
Because if you think we've got high income inequality in this country, you want to have a look at the wealth inequality statistics, which are enormous. Um, and certainly, when I look at the people that we work with, many of them have got no assets whatsoever. In fact, they've got debts, they've got significant debt problems, and that's a key reason why people fall out of work, particularly when they're first starting work and they're trying to bridge the gap to their first, um, their first paycheck. So, are there things to do to help people to build up assets as well as to get into the labour market and get on in the labour market? So what, what do we do about those, those three things? Well, more than anything, I've got a list of three things that I think we should do about them. Um, so the first is that uh, we called in a report at the, the end of last year for a new Getting On programme to help people to advance their careers. So just like when you're out of work, you get, um, whether it's through Job Centre Plus or the Work Programme or other support, you get a consultant, you get a skills training package, you get something personalised to your needs to help you get a job. I think you should have the same support to help you get on at work as well if you're in low pay. So we think that programme can actually uh, pay for itself, actually, if you look over time and savings in universal credit payments as people earn more and hence claim fewer in work benefits. So we think it's a clear case for a progression programme. The second is that um, I think public policy in general is struggling to catch up with the way that the labour market and people's lives have changed over the years. So um, people have much more flexible careers, they, have much more, they, they, they work short time jobs, several jobs at once, they move on to other careers. Very few people have a job for life um, these days. And yet our benefit system has struggled to catch up with that. And people have got trapped in this uh, gap between the in and out of work benefit systems for too, too long. And that's why I think the principle of universal credit is absolutely right, because it smooths that transition. So if you want to work a couple of hours a week, you'll be better off and you don't have to worry about getting back on benefits. If you want to work three, hour, three jobs together, you can do that and it's not going to screw up your benefit pay. And um, so the principle of universal credit is caught up with the way people are living their lives. And similarly, if you look at housing, um, We've had these really hard lines between tenure types in the past in the UK, uh, and it's been very difficult to jump between social renting, or private renting, or home ownership. Actually, in some of the things that housing associations are doing around shared ownership and part ownership, and those sorts of schemes, are helping to bridge that divide. But I don't think we've managed to put the two together and to help people to get their first footsteps in the labour market while starting to build up some assets. And that's where I think the employment system and the housing system needs to work more closely together. And I guess my final point is that I think we need to go for Hesel Time Plus, because I've worked in central government before, and I don't think we can do this stuff at central government level. We've tried, you know, we tried various combinations of different departments together, and you've just got a set of different people arguing in different rooms. So it's very difficult to do at national, national government level. I think you have to devolve it locally, and you have to go for Hesel Time Plus. It's sometimes, I find it quite ironic, we're sat here in 2013 talking about Michael Hesitine's blueprint for urban regeneration, but still, I think he's right. Um, so I think, we, I think we should go for Hesitine Plus. And I'll give you one quick final example as part of that. Um, we're about to start a trial in a couple of weeks' time in Swansea, where we're going to give some of our customers a personal job account. So we're going to roll up some of the, the cash that we would spend on them and that we would work an action plan for them. And we're going to say to them, what do you want to spend it on to get yourself into work from a given list? And we're working with uh, voluntary sector organisations in the Swansea area where we're going to pilot this to make sure that volunteering opportunities, including through housing associations where, where as I said, many of our customers live, are part of that package. And again, we're going to try and incentivise people to get into work as quickly and cheaply as possible, because if they get a job after three months, they can keep half of what's left in their personal account. Now, actually, we're going to do that. Um, I think it'll work, I hope it'll work, particularly given I've now said it on camera. Um, but I think there's much further government could do, could go to, in the next spending review and beyond, to roll up skills entitlements into a personal career account. To roll forward, you know, three months of benefit payments if you've got a track record of paying into the benefit system. There's, there's much more that we can do here if we think creatively, even given the fiscal constraints. So I'm really glad that we got this conference here today. I hope you've not all been sweltering too much in here. There's lots, lots of plans going, which is good. Um, I think we've got a real challenge to make the employment skills and housing systems work together. I think there's loads of great examples that we've heard about today. Um, and the challenge is how do we make that the norm and how do we make sure that the policy 
from central and local government supports that uh, so that the whole of these systems are greater than the sum of the parts. And I shall stop there. Um, I've come down from Leeds to talk to you today. I'm wearing two hats actually. The first is my day job as the founder, after many years in the private sector, of a social enterprise called the Head Partnership, which works to mobilise businesses and get them involved in supporting skills programmes locally. But I'm also sitting on the board of the Leeds City Region Local Enterprise Partnership. I don't think you've heard from anybody from a uh, so far today, so I thought I'd give you some perspectives, first of all, from, from the LEPS point of view, on this very important issue of upskilling the future generation. First, a little bit about um, the Leeds City Region uh, area. Um, a population of about 3 million, which uh, also contributes about 5% of, of the national GDA, makes it a larger economy actually than Wales and eight or nine European countries. Uh, so that's the, that's the size of, uh, of our challenge and our opportunity. A very diverse uh, business base um, and uh, particular strengths in financial services and, and manufacturing. And very interestingly, 95% of the people who work in the Leeds City region area also live there. But they don't necessarily live in the area where they work. They might live in a different local authority area. But we really are talking about quite an integral economic area. So this issue of skills and what happens in one local authority impacts on the whole region. So the LEPs were set up, obviously, in the wake of the uh, demise of the regional development agencies to provide public, uh, private sector, collaborative partnership approach to delivering growth around these uh, economic areas. Um, we've been going now for two years, I've been on the board since the beginning. I've just been reappointed. Um, and I've also been appointed as, as the <coughs> chair of the um, Leeds City Region Employment and Skills uh, Panel. Um, that's one of the panels, one of three panels that sits underneath the LEP to specifically look at what our skills challenges are uh, and particularly how they're interwoven with a number of our other linked themes around growth. Obviously creation of, um, of, of jobs, particularly around helping the SME uh, sector to grow, uh, but also making sure that we are uh, enabling them to grow by um, bringing on a flexible skill workforce. Um, so those, those linked uh, ambitions really, um, very important, uh, the, the issue of skills. Uh, you may not know, I found it interesting that one-fifth of UK economic growth is due to improvements in workforce skills. That's why it's important to us as a LEP. Um, businesses that don't invest in skills and training are more than twice as likely to go out of business, out, out of business than those that do. Um, in the Leeds City region, we're creating higher level skills at a proportionately much faster rate than we are lower level skills. And that's a big challenge for us when we've looked at labour market analysis about what that means for, uh, for um, our population, and particularly our young people coming through the system. And eradicating poor basic skills would add £800 million a year to poorly skilled people's earnings in our region alone. So we have challenges, as many areas do, around GCSE attainment uh, and employability skills particularly at the moment, high levels of needs, high levels of youth unemployment, above national average at around 23%. And importantly now, emerging this mismatch between where the trends are going in our economy, in the Leeds City region, and where the skills are. And so um, we very much focused on um, making sure that we can communicate to young people through schools, through colleges, through higher education, where those opportunities are going to be. This is going to be very critical going forwards. We're operating um, uh, some provision outside of the national contract. That's very interesting because I think it's testing um, the model of is local delivery and local delivery by partners and local determination of, of what provision we put in place a better um, response than, um, uh, than a national uh, one-size-fits-all one programme. Um, We've created local apprenticeship hubs in all of our areas. Uh, each local authority has been charged with um, stimulating the demand for apprenticeships um, and, um, and so particularly amongst SMEs to encourage take-up. 
And um, bearing in mind the, the, the problems that were uh, articulated there around SME engagement, uh, particularly around apprenticeships, we've also created an apprentice training academy uh, agency, sorry, which actually employs apprentices for SMEs, removes all of the legwork and paperwork from them, the training obligation from them, and, and effectively hires them back out to the SMEs. And so it's a way of getting um, more uh, apprentices placed within SMEs, developing the pool of apprentices, um, but without uh, but making it as easy as possible for the SMEs to get involved. So they're all LEP initiatives. Um, I mentioned um, the importance of uh, information to young people. Um, and this is what really where uh, it crosses over with my day job as well. Um, it's absolutely critical that we provide young people with up to the minute information on where the career opportunities are going to be. At the moment I think uh, too much of that has been done through a rear mirror and not enough looking and projecting ahead. And there are jobs that young people in our primary schools will be doing in 10 years time that don't even exist. And what we have to do through the LEP, every LEP, not just ours, is uh, make sure that we have put in place uh, the, the uh, sharing of intelligence and that we massively increase the engagement of our employers and private sector in our education system at every level, from primary level, secondary level upwards. So my final point, um, putting my day uh, hat on now, I just wanted to tell you about uh, one particular scheme that we run as a head partnership, which is repositioning education and business activity. Um, it builds long-term um, systemic partnerships between groups of businesses from different sectors and, and local schools, secondary schools and their partner primaries. Um, it's co-invested by the schools and by businesses. There hasn't been a penny of public money that's gone into developing or running this scheme to date. It's leveraging a million pounds of private sector investment into the education system each year benefiting tens of thousands of young people in Leeds. And um, interestingly, the activities that they're doing very much around bringing to life um, subjects like languages, maths and English, showing how they're of application in the workplace, encouraging enterprise, developing those core skills and flexible employability skills uh, for young people through, uh, through careers, information, uh, industry days, particularly around STEM. Uh, um, science, technology, English, uh, um, engineering and maths uh, agenda. Um, and, and effectively what it's developed is a place-based infrastructure that's delivered locally but that can operate along sectoral lines and really, um, really show young people where their opportunity lies. Now a few people have mentioned um, engagement with housing associations during the course of today and the extent to which uh, they've been involved. Um, now, in Leeds, um, where this scheme was launched two years ago, as I say, substantial amounts of co-investment have come in from employers, but not one of them has been a housing association. And so my challenge to you is, if you think that that sounds like an, an impressive scheme, why aren't you as housing associations leading the way and catalyzing that sort of um, scheme in your own areas? Thank you very much. peculiar position uh, in this particular uh, conference setting where many of the, the challenges and questions seem to be coming from the panel to the audience rather than the other way around. Uh, but, uh, but that's uh, an interesting situation to be in. Um, I, we are on quite a tight schedule so I won't use my usual uh, chair's privilege of uh, asking the first question to the whole panel. I did want to ask one quick question. Uh, just one quick question to Sinead and Nadine, because I think Sinead, you made some very interesting points about obligations on the part of your company to take on apprentices. You challenged your senior managers to take on apprentices. I'm wondering whether there should be a similar obligation on the part of government departments, on the part of uh, MPs. Uh, we run uh, an apprenticeship scheme uh, for MPs, offices. Uh, Ed Miliband has taken an apprentice. Matthew Hancock, the business minister, has taken an apprentice. The Labour Party has taken an apprentice. CCHQ has taken the Conservative campaign headquarters has taken an apprentice. But one of the problems that MPs uh, talk to us about is uh, the administrative difficulties of taking on apprentices, uh, but also the way that uh, MP staff budgets work. 
So I was wondering whether, Nadine, you'd be prepared to say something about whether there should be an obligation on the part of government departments, local councils, MPs to take on apprentices, and whether there's something that can be done about the way that staff budgets work within government departments, MPs' offices, to make that a little bit easier. Thank you, Martin. I, I, I think you're right. I think you know, the work you've done is commendable. Robert Halfon, MP, uh, has been leading the way on this. Uh, my office is awaiting our first apprentice on a different program that uh, is run by the House authorities, effectively, um, and is funded differently. That's the only way we could actually manage to do it, um, because otherwise the, the budget that I have for staff just doesn't stretch that far enough, in, in, in my opinion, because it was difficult to recruit the two and a half researchers I've got and the, the office manager that, that I have, which is all that MPs are, are allowed, essentially. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea to you know, walk the talk, you know, for government, for, um, you know, as I said in, in my earlier remarks, um, you know, housing associations, should be set a challenge to say, you know, come on, the great thing about being here today um, is that obviously people are doing innovative things. And, um, you know, Sinead was, uh, was an inspiring presentation uh, for us. But how do we scale this up? You know, um, I don't know whether Orbit is here from my patch. Uh, if you are, put your hand up if there's anyone from Orbit or Bromford. Um, but sadly, they're not here. I, I hope next year I can make sure that they attend uh, your conference here. The real challenge is we've probably got in this room the 10% the, the or, or probably less who are um, rising to the, 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 the challenge, who are doing innovative things uh, and don't see themselves as just housing providers. Uh, how do we scale this up? So in answering your question, I've just asked the question myself again. Thank you, David. I was just I was just keen to know your thoughts on how you might I don't know whether you could you could build this into the into procurement whether you could make it make uh, new building contracts uh, contingent on taking a certain number of apprentices. I don't know, there must be ways to do it. Well we, we, we are looking closely at that at the moment. Obviously the Social Value Act really helps and, and it's just about you know, the extent to which local authorities actually understand and embrace and make it happen. And it's there, it's in legisl legislative now, now they need to kind of, you know, make it happen for us. We know we've, we've come up against loads of barriers um, by local authorities and by other partners. For instance, um, we work with a construction company, Kia, who says they've, they've created 500 apprenticeships over a £400 million um, repairs and maintenance contract with the local authority and she suddenly found out that they got their sums wrong and they couldn't create any. So what we said to them was, and of course we splashed all over the local press, look, the SAID is here, you know, and all that. Um, so we said, I tell you what, we'll run a supply chain event, get all of the people who supply you in the room and tell them if they want work off you, you've got to take an apprentice. Use this business here, because we'll facilitate this and we'll pay for this event, but actually we're also a non-profit making social enterprise and that money can be tracked back and targeted into communities that will benefit um, you know, your preferences, so use us. And they created something like 75 apprentices in the supply chain. Now, it's not loads, but it made a difference. And I think that it's about, you know, I don't care whether it's one, or whether it's 50, or it's 500, but I know that our business has been nosy enough to create 500 outside of our own sphere of influence, uh, you know, direct influence. And some of the way we funded it, we looked at agency staff, for instance, and your, your concept, with the academy we called it, training up a pool of you know, young, enthusiastic people, some of whom perhaps haven't had the greatest start in life in our, in our cases. And, and, and then using those, we already share some with other housing associations. And we're actually giving them a chance to get things wrong in a supported environment before we can move them into some of the SMEs or local businesses that we work with. So to me, it's just like, you know, there's, there's ways, there's, it's just about finding the way that suits your geography. What to respond to what's just been said as, as part of the response to other questions, then uh, of course, feel free. Um, 
I think the question on kind of employment and housing associations is always a very interesting debate because we very rarely get back to the conversation about housing association as employers. Um, and as you say, you do lots of work within your own business about that. But actually, that's quite rare. Um, and there are housing associations who are now beginning to set targets for themselves um, to employ within their own tenant group. Um, what does the panel think about how we shift the debate about housing associations not as welfare organisations that support their tenants into someone else's employment, but how they actually support them into their own employment as quite major employers in some of the communities across the country? Excellent. Uh, I'll take Philip's uh, question as well. One of, one of the things we haven't tackled in what, quite frankly, was a fascinating panel, and every one of the presentations um, really extended the debate, is the link between housing and employment. Now, what happens in Britain if you're poor uh, is you tend to be housed with other poor people. And, and if you have less and less life chances, you tend to hang out with, be housed with, concentrate with other people who have lower and lower life chances. And given that we know that people's life chances are in some very profound way related to their social network, this is the very worst outcome for skills, for training. So what I want to ask the panel is, what more can you demand of housing associations? Because it would seem to me that one of the things you should demand is that they house people with low skills alongside those with high skills. That's the first thing that occurs to me. But that's an uncomplex reflection. I'm sure there are more issues. I'm sure housing associations say, hey, hold on, we can't do that. But from the perspective of employment and skills, just dream a little. Tell me, outside of regulation, because we can change regulation, outside of regulation, how would you like to see housing run in order to maximise skills and opportunities. About this issue, should we start from this end of the panel, Steph? Uh, well, you, you're right that housing associations are, are major employers. I think, Sinead, you employ 650 people, you said, um, which even in Leeds would be a, a very substantial employer with a city like that. Um, and um, I think that um, when, when housing associations are looking at their, um, their employment strategies, um, there should be many different facets to it. And one is, what, what are we doing as an employer? What are we doing to offer this career progression? Um, also through our, through, through, through our organisation. Um, how, how easy are we making it for our own tenants to access employment uh, within our organisation? Um, what are we doing to engage with young people in our area to profile job opportunities and career opportunities within housing associations? We've done a little bit of that through Make Grey uh, with, with the housing associations in Leeds. Um, but this question about um, um, housing and the concentration of social housing in certain areas, what impact that has then on schooling, concentration of young people from particular social economic groups in, um, in, in, in similar schools um, which aren't truly comprehensive in the way that uh, it was always intended because uh, it isn't a mixed community in that sense. Um, I think it's a very, a very good one. Um, I don't know anything about um, how housing associations choose where they place people. But certainly we have had excellent results from getting businesses to go into schools in these areas and help create some of these social networks and connectivity for young people that they may lack in their areas. I think if you could um, pursue strategies where you can mix people up um, and have uh, young people being educated there in a local primary school um, that is more representative, I think that would be an excellent idea. I'd be very interested to hear from the floor um, any thoughts that people have from housing associations on that. Um, uh, uh, two, two pretty tough questions. Um, so on the, on the first one, I think that actually um, all public spending should and um, public um, employment should have clear local apprenticeship and um, local unemployed people um, as targets within it. So the social value access to maintain makes that absolutely clear that you can do that. Actually, you could do it before, which is people worried about EU procurement rules, but the Office of the Government of Commerce published the best practice guides like that 12 years ago. So you, so you could always do it, but you definitely can now. Um, and I think um, you know, Andrew Adonis is going to ask some questions, doesn't he, about um, 
the number of apprentices employed, and young people employed in different government departments. Um, and uh, so I think that it's incumbent on all the government departments, local government, housing associations, people like working links to, to do a bit better <laughs> in terms of direct employment, and some of that can be driven by procurement. Um, I could probably answer the, the sort of dream a little question um, for about until the battery on this runs out. Um, but I'll try and limit myself to a couple of things. So the first is the point about networks. I think it's really, really, really important. Um, so um, we need to find ways to build different forms of networks given the way people live their lives today, which isn't just about face, it's about technology and about whole bunch of other stuff. So for example, when I look at Job Centre Plus or the work programme, I always think it's a bit daft that we're getting people who were detached from the labour market with turning their lives around through this brilliant consultant person relationship and then we send them out the door and we don't ask them to mentor the next person that's walking through the door. Um, so I think we can do much more of that sort of stuff and actually housing associations are well placed to do that as well given the concentrations that you, you were talking about. And then I guess the second thing I say is about that sort of um, the concentration. So I was talking um, in the, the, the sort of beginning there about the, the hard boundaries between tenure types that we tended to have in this country. Um, and I think, you know, when we talk about the school system and we, we don't want selection in the school system, we've got it by house price. Um, so, so I think there is something about, uh, I don't know exactly how you do this, but there is something about enforcing in new developments, we need to do this in the existing housing stock too, and you get a much greater income mix. And so the idea that um, you know, we should chuck Bob Pro out of his council house because he yeah, earns 100, well there may be many reasons why you want to do that, but certainly, <laughs> certainly not because he earns 100,000 pounds a year. You might want to charge him a little bit extra, although you probably care about uh, work incentives, not necessarily for Bob Pro, but tied down with the Bob Pro thing. Uh, but, but we don't want to chuck people out of social housing as soon as they start earning some money. And we need to get that proper mix, whether that's through the planning system, through development, through a whole bunch of other stuff. And we need to ease people's passage through. So we know that there aren't just a bunch of people who are out of work forever and that's it. It's people go in and out of work. So we need to help people to get their foot on the ladder once they've got their foot in the door of the jobs market. So I think lowering those tenure types, getting much more mixed income, genuinely mixed income development, and thinking about how you help people progress has got to be critical as well. Yeah. It sounds a bit like social engineering to me. Dangerous territory. It's already social engineering. Yeah. <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. Well, the point being made the back is, is a good one, i.e. Uh, look at your own uh, workforce and see what you can do uh, with your tenants. Um, on Philip's point, I think yeah, a minute ago I mentioned my own housing in orbit not being here. Actually, some of the work they do in terms of where they put um, their housing has been quite innovative in the sense of going into the villages and making it confused rather than um, you know, lumpy, you know, as you put it, all the poor people together. Um, and, and that's been uh, really interesting for them. Um, I like Stephen's earlier idea when he was presenting about having uh, government look at the concept of a consultant to help you get on in work, i.e. you progress, not just get you into, into work. Um, and I think, you know, I sort of alluded to it in my uh, uh, presentation, you know, housing associations sit in the middle of the community. They are a powerhouse because of the resources they have available, the funding they have available to them. You know, the, the day, you know, money does make a huge difference. Um, I'm going to dream a little, but dream like a geek, which is my old world at, at YouGov, um, and just think what they could do with data mining and opening up some of that data, because they do hold some valuable data. Um, uh, obviously, it requires consent and all sorts of things, protection around it. But you know, what more can we do to harness technology uh, within housing associations? to be able to engage with SMEs, do all the other things that we've heard, uh, the good things that we've heard from the panel and, 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 and the other panels earlier today. And so that would be my, my dream. What can you do uh, around data? My dream would be to stop building housing 
because actually housing focuses on the physical and actually what we're talking about is people and that's why it's not always that sexy because education and health is all about people, housing is about houses. It feels inanimate. Now, you know, for me, I'd, I'd make government value the range of activities in some public way. Look what happened when we had audit commission inspections. How much competition is there in the sector? People vying to be the best. That's what the sector's like. Now, what we need to do is introduce competition around employment and skills and let's sit seen as a valued and very much publicly valued part of the solution that housing associations can offer. If the government recognised that, instead of giving us diverse papers on diversity, it will stop us doing that, a diverse activity, and sees it as a rounded offering in, in, in challenged communities, and then they valued it publicly, there'd be competition, and suddenly everybody could do it. Thank you very much. Um, well, I mean, the, the challenge has been thrown out to you out there. We do something a little bit unusual and uh, uh, ask people in the audience to give us some examples of good practice from what you're already doing. Uh, you know, some, some inspiring stories of, uh, of how this kind of work is, is already being done, or indeed some dreams of how it might be done better. I'm Reverend James, well, I'm, a big one. I'm the Vice Chair of Pop Life and Board. Um, I think the challenge here is getting right from the onset. Um, Bob Laka means Housing and Regeneration Community Association. So it's, it's um, in effect encompassing everything all together. And when you talk about regeneration, it's not just about housing. And that's why I bought into uh, mixed tenure, where we have people join together so there's no division. People know exactly who is living next door and that raises aspiration and that's one of the things that is essential. What once the Aspen Association gets it right from the onset, then they know that we're not just about the bricks and mortar, we're about everything that can transform the society. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can ask the, uh, the panel out this slide running out of time, but I can ask the panel a final uh, a final question here, um, which, which is this really. Um, we seem to have, uh, I've been talking recently to, to David Lammy, who's uh, uh, MP in Tottenham, has had to respond today to uh, an extraordinary piece in Time Out uh, about uh, how you can't go to Tottenham without getting stabbed. Um, very, very difficult part of the, uh, part of the country. And there's a certain um, belief on the part of MPs like him in London that there's something profoundly wrong with social housing in this country and that perhaps there should be some radical demolitions that, uh, that take place. Is that something that is simply in the realms of utopia, talking from uh, an expert point of view, or do we really need to start thinking about some radical solutions here? I'd like to turn to that. I think you'll kind of guess that I'm all for radical solutions by now. And we, we already did actually a lot of that in, in our community, which is obviously small scale, but we've got areas where we knew that as much as we, we could get involved and the number of single regeneration budgets and uh, home zoning and you name it, nothing was going to change it except something like a big bulldozer and frankly that's what we did. And you know, that, that sounds, you know, you, I can see you pulling faces. <laughs> I'd love you to speak and tell me why you're pulling that face. But you know, we needed that. We needed that to happen in our community so we could build and create a new future for people and say, this is what you're worth, because actually they weren't worth the crap they were being given. So, yes, I agree. I spent three terms, 12 years, in Wandsworth Council. Um, and the Arndon Estate, some of you may know, the Rohanton Estate. Um, uh, yeah, the Arndale for a long time was a no-go area. Um, in fact, that whole area was you know, you either going with school drugs or deal drugs. Um, uh, when I was a kid growing up in the area. Um, we were able to regenerate without demolition. We were able to do some innovative work. Uh, the real innovation has to be said it was right to buy for us the more when people felt they had ownership they actually improved you know, the, 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 their own bit of the, of, of the estate 
and that was infectious because other people felt that they had to do the same thing and it's that sort of network effect I guess uh, uh, you know, working well I applaud the government actually for going back to a right to buy but tweaking it to get it right i.e. the money doesn't go back to the treasury it goes back into building more uh, social housing uh, because you know, for all the reasons that we know I'm not going to rehearse them right now otherwise we'll be here all night um, so I think there's a lot to be done uh, by you know, designing out, regenerating, uh, giving people ownership. Again, you know, I'm going back to what Steve was saying about assets and how you build assets. If, if, you're, if, if you have ownership, you're proud of it, you'll do something about it, and you'll probably hold someone to account if they're behaving um, uh, negatively in, 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 within the community. So I think those, those are really important values. Uh, you know, I think I think even bigger than that because you know I remember I used to work for the Mayor of London and I remember TfL showing us lots of data about how in the east of London there was lots of people out of work just south of the river um, and there were lots of jobs just north of the river and nobody connected the two because there wasn't actually a river crossing. Um, so so actually you need you need some transport links and you need to design the transport and the housing and all the other stuff together. Um, and that's why you can't do it at national government level. So, you know, I used to be, um, I'm a sort of reformed ex-Treasury civil servant, and with all due respect to my former colleagues, they, they're not going to know about whether we need an extra stop on the Northern Line in Battersea. You know, you need, you need to do that, at, you need to do that at, at local level, but you need to put the transport, the regeneration, the housing and the employment together, and that's where you get the solutions. But the second, just the other point I make, is about how you fund it, because, um, you know, there's not a lot of uh, cash floating around to spend on this and actually if you look at the southeast in particular we need way way more homes that's why house prices have gone up and rents have gone up because we haven't got enough homes um, so as well as um, knocking some down and uh, doing the transport infrastructure you need to build some more as well particularly, particularly in southeast but elsewhere as well so how do you pay for all this well actually if i think um, across to uh, Vauxhall which is where i live and they're regenerating uh, the whole Vauxhall Nine Elms area putting in new tube stops all the rest of it there's going to be a massive increase in property prices and in um, business income there. And so things like the, the, the government has rightly introduced like tax income and financing where you can pull forward the extra income that you would get as a council or as a local area from that to pay for it up front. It makes perfect sense. You can squeeze that cash out wherever you can, wherever you can get hold of it. Um, so I think, I think I'll probably be even more radical and uh, think about bridges uh, cars, tubes, you know, it's great that the people of East London have got a cable car to get to those jobs and it looks lovely. I think we need a bridge or a tunnel as well. Yes, and again, from the, the LAPS point of view, you know, making sure we've got the right infrastructure to support the thriving economy um, is very important. Things like broadband housing, transport links, you know, where the housing is situated is, is and making sure that that's done strategically, I think, is, is, uh, is crucial. Um, I am not a fan of knocking things down and building new things. I think the physical environment is just one aspect. And whilst I accept that there are probably people in, uh, living in accommodation which is substandard and they're entitled to much better, I think if you don't tackle some of the other issues, you can knock down and rebuild as many times as you like. The problems won't go away. Um, and so it, it really is, gentleman was talking about an all-encompassing solutions. You know, I think that the physical environment is one part of it, but engendering community ownership and opportunity, and in particular for me, always capturing the imaginations of the young people. For the young people, I don't think you can invest in them enough because they're the people that will have the opportunity to break out of, uh, out of their situation, vicious circle, if we, if we get that right point to, to end today on. Um, I shall, uh, just if it's left to me, to thank you for coming. Uh, I'll, thank, I'll, do, I'll do the closing. And you'll do the closing yeah. remarks, yeah. Uh, and, uh, as public, um, I will, you know, I think it's, it would be good to thank the panel, who've been great. <laughs>